today we are pleased to present Teresa Greedy. Greedy. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Okay. But I even rehearsed this. <laughs> it, was, it was with the Amador County, California archives. Teresa was born and raised in Amador County, California. Parts of her family have been in Amador and the Calaveras counties for five to six generations. She studied architecture and engineering in college and worked in those fields until she was hired to work in the county facility. Uh, facilities department in 2006. She worked there until the position in the archives opened. Since she had always loved history, it sounded like the perfect job for her. So in May of 2013, she transferred to the archives. She cites it as the best professional decision that she's ever made. Working in the archives has given her the opportunity to meet people from all over the U.S. and the world. She states that she has learned so much about Amador County history and the many pioneer families who made it what it is today. Today's topic is going to be the Amador County archives, and uh, the archives reflect the unique history of Amador County with a large variety of photos, maps, and documents. In April of 1980, a local historian by the name of Larry Senado started the archives. Larry ran the archives as a volunteer until December of 1984 when he became a county employee. The archive caters to authors, historians, genealogists, and anyone interested in the history of the area. Today she will cover the many genealogical collections available to assist you with your family history research. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Teresa. Hello. Hello. Um, so I thought I'd start today. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we probably first want to cover how to get to my website. And so let me minimize. Okay, so if you go onto the internet, so let me see if I can pull it up. We've got so many windows open here. Okay. So you're going to want to go to Amador County Home. See, see that it's right here at the top. Oh my, it's working really slow. Come on, get up there. There we go. So you click onto the home page, and I gave the link, which is if you type that into your browser, you're going to get it. But if you don't, if it's not a hot link. You, you'll, it's this is makes it easier. So you get into the county homepage, and I'm under services. Archives. Okay, so when you get onto this page, you're going to go to collection search. If you see the, the four guys sitting in the chairs, then you know you got in the right spot. Okay, and then right here is a hotkey. It's called collection. You click on that and it'll open up a PDF file. And that's my search document. Okay, if you hit control F, that brings up a search bar and you can type in a word. So let's just say K-E and -E Kennedy. Now it's gonna look through um, see the numbers here that it's running through. So it's finding all instances of the word Kennedy. And so there's a lot of them in here. But that's basically how you do a search here. And then what you do is when you find the first one, okay, so say number 12 is a, a photo and you're interested in seeing that, you, you write that down, but there's no search we're not modernized enough to where you can actually click on it and see what the picture looks like. You have to uh, contact the archives and uh, to get a look at what we have in the collection. So do you guys have any questions? Um, they can go ahead if they have questions, they can put them in the chat box if you'd like, that way you can continue with your presentation and we can okay. answer the questions towards the end. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and exit that window and I'm going to go back. So I'm still on the Amador County page and I'm going to go to departments now and I'm going to go to the library page. This is another excellent resource. And these are the local newspapers from 1855 to 2018. So we'll click on that link. 
This is a kind of a slow computer, so. Uh, anyway, and then this shows you the different newspapers. So if you have kind of an idea of the area or the year in which your family, um, you know, came from, you can you can click into this and it gives you like, so it'll give you the years that that newspaper was printed. Okay. So say I want to search, I'll just search my, my, uh, my family name, so we'll go. That's my maiden name. So now it's searching. So then here's all. So so like here's my brother. Here's my brother, um, my father. You know, it'll it will. Here's me. It'll find where there's an article or something about you in the newspaper. And it's really neat. And, and like when you, especially when you get in some of the older newspapers, there'll be really funny stories like um, uh, Mary Jo Smith and her daughter, uh, Marilyn, went to Sacramento to visit her sister. They had tea cakes. And, you know, it's just, it's really, it's fun to read the stories. And, and I always tell people, if you're going to go look at these newspapers, you're going to want to give yourself plenty of time because, um, you three hours will go by and you know you won't even know it i mean it, it really takes a long time so i'm bringing up just a newspaper page real quick just to show you what it looks like so here you can zoom in that's actually my brother pitching baseball i'm not sure who that is Anyway, um, it's really it's really interesting. This this is more of a modern paper, but um, um, anyway, but it just gives you an idea, and you can look all the way back to 1855. So there's a lot of information on that side. So anyway, I'll go ahead and get out of this, and I will bring up. So I was contacted last week, actually, by um, a lady who was interested in finding out about her great grandfather. And so she actually had the um, uh, the information on his naturalization papers. So that made it really easy for me to look up. So I did a search on our search file. I found his name, and this was the first item I found, which is actually the receipt for his naturalization. So it shows the form, it shows his number, his first, his first and last name. So his first name was Giovanni uh, Frescura. He was age 30. Um, he, the page was num, uh, 280. Um, anyway, it just gives all of the information on the day that he, so this was his naturalization day. Um, Let's see. Um, this is his wife. It's actually Josefina Cristino. And I don't know if in Italian it's supposed to be a G or if it's a J. I know in Spanish it's a J. And she was 27 at the time. And then it shows that they had one child, Charlie, and he was age six and they lived in Jackson. And then here's his signature. So that was the first item that I received. And the thing that was really exciting about this actual one was that I don't always have all of the information that I found on this particular person. So, um, so I'll just turn the page, okay. So here is, okay, so this is in a, a giant book. It's like probably two feet wide by two and a half feet tall. It's, it's really large. And um, this is his certificate of arrival. So this shows that he, you know, that he arrived in New York. Uh, so on Ellis Island, and it gives his serial number, uh, the date uh, uh, on Ellis Island, July 22nd, uh, 1900, I think it's five. Anyway, and it has his name, his date of arrival, and then the ship that he was on. Okay, so that was the next page, okay. And then this was his declaration of intentions. So 
typically when someone is um, working, they're working on getting their naturalization, they have to do a declaration of intention that says that they want to become a citizen. So this was the next page and it has all of his information. I just love the handwriting. It's just really beautiful. So this is his, was his age when he first requested naturalization and it gives his, you know, vital statistics, um, where he came from, um, his birth, uh, where he lives now, uh, where he um, actually left Europe to come to America. He left uh, Chatburg, France on the Celtic. And he was from Dragoni, Italy. Uh, and then um, talks about the king. Um, anyway, it's just really interesting that, you know, it really gives all of their vital information. And let's see, you get the next page. Okay, so the next page is actually his petition for naturalization. And so it, I believe he had like three years by the time he did his declaration to his declaration of intention to his uh, petition for naturalization. And usually, you know, on some of these, I'll actually have letters of reference. Um, on this one, I think, I think it's on the second page. He had people who actually signed uh, and, you know, as, uh, you know, as references for him. But uh, anyway, let me go to the next page. Okay, so this is the back page of that declaration. So this shows, um, that he is not no longer going to have an oath of allegiance to uh, the the emperor, and then um, this is the court, um, and then okay, I guess on this page it didn't have the witnesses. Um, it must be on one of the others. Okay, so this is his the facts for his petition. Okay, so that one is, so here's, this one lists his wife and his, his um, he's a minor and the ship that he came in on, here's his wife, Josefina. And then his, this is his son. And when his son was born, And then, oh, okay, here's the one that has the people who um, who uh, vouched for him. So Joseph Dallo and William Harvey both um, uh, stood up for him. Let's see, okay, so we're back to the beginning. So I will exit this and exit this one. Okay, so um, some of the other items that I have that you can search, um, I didn't, I don't have any scans right now, but I have marriage certificates, I have homesteads, you know, where people, um, you know, came across and they, you know, picked a plot of land and they homesteaded it. Um, I also have like property transfers. So, you know, like if, if uh, someone purchased a piece of property, there's, there's title. I also have court documents if someone was arrested and, um, and was sent to jail or if they got into an altercation or they were being sued or something like that. Um, uh, I have that kind of documentation. I also have coroner's reports uh, some of them are pretty gruesome. Uh, they're pretty interesting. Um, a lot of people got into really horrible accidents, especially in the mines. Um, anyway, but it's really, really interesting to read. Um, I have, um, and then this was another one. I, I had a fellow from Switzerland contact me whose father, whose grandfather had come to America and worked at the Keystone mine. And uh, so um, he kind of had the dates and times that he thought that he worked there. So I searched through and I was able to find his grandfather. 
um, uh, Perot was his last name. So let me find him. Oh, here it is. So there was his, that. So there was his his grandfather, and it showed when he started work. And I believe they made like fifty cents a day or something. And so anyway, so this shows the payroll of for you know. So here's his grandfather's pay. He got twelve dollars. Um, I have another page that I found that, and that was the last page of when he worked. So here's his grandfather and he worked all of these days and he got $45. So anyway, wouldn't do very well in today's inflation, <laughs> but anyway, so that was really interesting. And, and uh, Philippe was actually writing a book. And so when he finished the book, he actually, he and his brother and sister came with a copy and brought it to me so I would have a copy and we went out for a glass of wine and had a nice visit. It's been, you know, that's the thing I think is one of the main perks of, of doing this job is that, you know, I get to meet people from all over. I've had authors from Australia, um, from France. Uh, I worked with a guy who was doing a documentary on um, a woman named Madame Pantaloon, who was uh, from France, who came over as a pioneer. And she actually worked right along with the men in the, you know, gold panning. And then she uh, got enough of a stake and she bought um, uh, uh, some interest in a mine. And then when she made enough, she actually ended up buying 300 acres of property and she become a, became a grape grower and winemaker. And so she was actually very famous or infamous, um, you know, because she basically, she dressed like a man. She got arrested a couple of times because uh, cross-dressing was not allowed back in those days. And so um, anyway, but she, she has a very interesting story. And he actually did a documentary, which is gonna be picked up by PBS um, fairly soon. So, um, so that one's gonna be on. And so that, it's been really fun working with with people like that. Um, then I have several uh, volunteers who come in who actually are historians and authors as well. So they're very helpful because they really understand how to do research, you know, because they've had to research for their own books. So, um, you know, so it's been really interesting. And um, a lot of college kids will come in and, you know, work on papers, you know, so we'll help them with their research and, um, you know, to complete their assignments um and um and then also a lot of a lot of people who are interested in their family history and um you know that i would say is probably one one of our main things that we do a lot of people have been working you know people are getting more interested in doing their de genealogy and and finding out where they came from and and so you know that's been really interesting as well um I thought I would show you uh, now some photos, you know, just some photos that we have in the archives um, and just kind of explain some of the stuff that we, you know, that we have available. Um, if you, you know, we do have family, we have family portraits, um, but I'd love to get more and not all of them are identified. So they're really neat pictures, but, you know, sometimes if I don't have a name, then it doesn't really have as much value as far, you know, for genealogy research anyway. So this first picture is the picture that is on our, um, our webpage. And um, these guys were called the original armchair detectives. And I do have their names. So the first guy here, that is Pat Dwyer. Um, this guy here is Anthony Caminetti Sr. And Anthony Caminetti actually was a very, very prominent um, uh, pioneer uh, person. He was, he started out as an attorney and then he became a judge. Then from being a judge, he became a Senator. And then uh, after he finished his term as a Senator, he became the, um, um, the secretary of, of immigration. So he actually was like a cabinet had a cabinet position at the White House and he 
you know, helped with immigration. Hot topic nowadays. Uh, and then this guy is August Laveroni. And actually, um, I, I, I have friends who are, you know, descendants of his, uh, the Laveronis. And then this is Virgilio Podesta. And I also have friends who are, you know, so they're, they still have family that live in the area. Um, go to the next one. Okay, so this is the head frame. This is the original head frame for the Kennedy. Um, if you notice, it's a wooden head frame. Um, I have pictures later. Uh, this actual head frame caught fire in, uh, let's see, 1928 and uh, actually burned to the ground. So then uh, they had to rebuild it. So they did a metal one. And that's the one that if you came to Amador County, that's the one you will see. Now, the Kennedy is is one of the more famous mines here in Amador County. It was the deepest uh, hard rock mine uh, in the world for many, many years until really until modern times. Um, the Kennedy was over a mile deep um, and uh, it was one of the richest, had a very rich vein that it, in, it uh, was working and uh, brought in the, um, probably the most um, gold from all of the mines, you know, in Amador County. Um, the Argonaut, which is just up the hill from it, and I have some pictures of that, that was also a very rich gold mine and the, the uh, Keystone in Amador City. And I, I think I have some photos of that that I've put in this slide presentation. But so this, this photo is from about 1913, and you can see, um, that's the city of Jackson in the background here. Um, I don't see Butte Mountain. That's kind of a famous, if you've been to Jackson, that's kind of a famous um, landmark in, in our county. You know, here's a guy, a worker. But anyway, um, I just, the, this actual photo is about an inch wide by maybe two inches long. It's a little tiny photo, but they're just the the clarity on some of these old photos is just really amazing. Um, the quality. So let me go to the next photo. Okay, so here, here's um, <clears throat> here's a fire at the Kennedy. This one was in 1928, September 7th, and that's when the wooden head frame burned. So you can see the wood, you know. Um, on fire. Anyway, it was it was a total loss. Um, anyway, and um, in Jackson, my dad tells me about um, he was born in 28, actually, but um, but he said, you know, in Jackson, you would know when there was something wrong because um, if the stamp mill stopped because they so they had these huge stamp mills that were crushing the rock that they were mining for. And um, it was very, very noisy. And so if the stamp mill shut down, you know, everybody stopped and was like, oh no, what happened? Because, um, you know, they, they never stopped. They ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So anyway, so that this would have been a day that the stamp mills would have stopped. And there's a picture of the, that's the steel head frame that's there now. And, um, that's like an overview of the whole Kennedy mine. So this is the, uh, the, the mill. Um, this is the change house. Um, that building is pretty much gone. This one is still here. <clears throat> That's where they do the gift shop and the, they have a mine, uh, you know, like a little mine tunnel tour. And then up here, this is the office and the assayer's office. And so they would, um, uh, the, they would get their paychecks there there were a few rooms for the guys to stay in. Um, so some of the single miners had um, had a bunk room there and, and um, it was a triple bunk room. So what they would do is there were three shifts. So one guy would be there sleeping, one guy would be at work and the other guy would be off doing his thing. And then he had eight hours in the room. Then the next guy would leave and so they would hot bunk it so that the next guy would come in and go to sleep while the next guy went to work, while the next guy went out to, you know, do his thing. So, um, 
anyways, uh, and then down in this part of the building, that's where they would um, uh, test the gold for its purity and that sort of thing. And they would also do uh, gold bars there. Okay. Um, this is a shot of downtown Ione, which is one of the, the other cities in Amador County. This is, um, let's see, do I have a year? Um, let's see. Uh, this was, uh, let's see. I don't have a year on this photo, but I'm guessing it's probably um, the 1920s-ish because of the cars. It could be slightly later though, because that looks like a newer car and you know people would have kept their older cars for quite a while. So anywhere, but this is a nice little shot of downtown Nyon. Okay. Now this is a shot of the Kennedy. This is the uh, just a crew of guys. I don't have a whole lot of identities on this, but the thing that's nice about this is if you do know that your grandfather or your great grandfather worked in the mines, at least you have an idea of, you know, what they may have looked like and what they may have done there at, you know, at the Kennedy. Okay. Uh, okay, so now this one is, um, a shot. Um, I, I, I don't think I downloaded the information on it, but but these are are some very prominent guys. Uh, this this guy here is John Begovich. John Begovich was a war hero. He was in the uh, Italian uh, conflict and uh, captured a, a you know a, a sizable amount of of soul of German soldiers. Uh, he ended up becoming um, a senator. And uh, then uh, after he, you know, um, left the Senate, he became a board of supervisor. But the big story um, about John was that he uh, rode his horse down into the state capitol uh, because he was trying to uh, get a bill passed. And so that was his big sort of claim to fame was that he actually wore, rode a horse down into uh, the this assembly room and uh, and caused a big stir, um, and it's it's really funny because I knew I knew John when I was a kid, and then I knew him as an adult. But uh, he would come to to visit with my dad, and he smoked a great big cigar and used a lot of colorful metaphors. And uh, my mother would always, you know, usher us kids out of the room so we wouldn't hear all of the stuff that he talked about. So. Anyway, uh, but this is just right here in downtown Jackson. Uh, they got a couple bucks and they they were showing off their their catch to the to town and and uh, anyway, so that's the story of this picture. I'm going to say this probably the 60s, maybe early 70s. Um, anyway, I just thought it was fun. Okay, so now this picture is of Sutter Creek, and this is an early picture. Um, let's see, this is the uh, IOF anniversary parade down the Main Street, Center Creek. And this building right here is the American Exchange Hotel now. Uh, for many years, it was a, the Bilotti Inn, um, but they have a really, really nice restaurant there and a, hotel, and a nice hotel to stay in. Um, but this is a nice shot of Center Creek. Um, and uh, if you notice, everybody is in period dress. Now, I don't know what the year is on this, whether or not people dressed up for this occasion or if it actually was during that time period. Um, anyway, I just thought it was really a neat picture with lots of people in it. Um, back in those days, they didn't have entertainment like we have. So, you know, when you had a parade, everybody came because that was the big event. It's during the time period. Look at all the spectators. Yeah. I think so, but they also had this in Cedar Creek. They had um, um, it was called Gold Rush Days, and they would actually dress up in period costume. and I, And I have a picture. Um, Count the stars on that American flag that's hanging from the sidewalk eve. Oh, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't really. That'll tell. give you that, that one that's yeah. hanging down, down. Yeah. Oh, here. Right there. 
yeah. that you should be able to count the stars on that. That'll give you a good idea what year it was. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't say the year on this one. So anyway, but. But if you count I, the stars, you can figure out how yeah. many states there were and yeah. that'll give you approximate date of year. It's less than 48, because these are eight and these are seven. So eight, 16, 24, eight, 40, 40. So 45 stars, it looks like. Interesting. So Todd will give you the answer. There Don't. you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Todd, Todd is I'm our Googling technology. It. He's there our technology go. guru. There you go. There you go. That's how 18, 1896. Oh, okay. So it is time period. That's yeah. awesome. It's Victorian era. Uh-huh. I'm gonna write that one down. But I would say that just by looking at the ladies in their dress on yeah. the sidewalk, it just looks like everyone's period. Yeah. Their mustaches. Yeah, that's true. Their haircuts. True. Yeah, it's period. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. Anyway, so I, I, the, I this is a neat picture. So uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, so here is another picture. This is the Kennedy Mine. Let me see if I have a 31. I'm sorry, this is the, the Keystone. And the year is 1905. But I mean, I love the quality. But you can see, yeah, and you can tell that it's a little bit later because of their carbide lamps. Um, but the, um, the thing that's interesting, and this is something some, uh, an old timer told me, is the candles. So they would take these candles, see they're, how they're on like a little kind of a spike thing. So they would use a candle, a shift. So if they were gonna work a double shift, they would have extra candles. So see this guy, he's got a candle here and two more candles there. So he might, he's probably working a double or a triple shift. Here's another guy with the extra candles. So he's probably working an extra shift. Um, but anyway, and so the thing that's nice about this is because they're so clear, if you actually have a picture of your grandfather, you could probably pick him out from this group photo because they're, it's very, very clear what they look like. So look at that mustache. And I'm gonna say this is one of the, one of the superintendents. Uh, anyway. Striking, striking that no one smiles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, and I think it took a little while for the yeah. picture to expose, so you had to right. just kind of hang out there for a while. So no, yeah, in the middle, yeah. there's grimacing pretty good though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no Delta Dental plans. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, that guy's a character looking with that beard. So anyway, but uh, it's too so bad. Is, go ahead. It's, it's too bad in the years past. And I think this is, you know, like when I'm looking at all my grandma's pictures and stuff, it's too bad that a lot of these pictures didn't write down the names of all these people, you know? Yes, it yeah. is very much too bad. I do have one from the Kennedy where they've actually identified quite a few of the people in it. Um, and I, I, it's really, I love that one. Um, this one was very close to the time that um, 
Philippe's grandfather was working in the mines. And actually my great grandfather was working in the mines as well. And so I keep trying to look through there and see if I can figure out which one he is. Um, but uh, um, anyway, it's, it's interesting. And, and so this one actually made it into uh, Philippe's book, this picture. Okay, so now here's a shot of um, downtown Jackson. Let's see if I have a year. Uh, 1930s is what this one says. And um, it's not very clear, but here you can see the Argonaut. There's the Argonaut up on the hill. And the Kennedy is, is over in this direction. You wouldn't be able to see it. So this is the, the highway now comes through right around here. So this is the bottom of the, of the Argonaut, at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the skip. And this is where the shaft was up here. Um, but this is, a, I, th I like this photo. It's, it's just really interesting to see, you know, there's the telephone lines are not there anymore. You know, everything is underground, um, but it's interesting to see the old buildings, how they're very similar to what they are now, but, um, you know, so not a lot has changed really in downtown. The cars obviously have changed a lot, but. Um, anyway, and the, and the telephone po poles are gone, but you can still see the Argonaut up on the hill and uh, a lot more houses now. And then this picture, I don't know what it, what it is, but I just thought it was hilarious. So um, I didn't, I don't have any information on who the gals are, um, but I just thought it was really funny. So I thought I'd share it. I don't know what they're doing with the brooms, but anyway. Okay, here's a shot. Let's see. This is the Kennedy. This is in 1902. Um, I just, I love the hats. They're so almost like rain hats. But again, very, very clear. You can really see faces. So you could pick out, you know, possibly pick out your grandfather. That guy looks too young to be a minor, but who knows? Is that a lunch bucket right there that that one guy in the front is holding? Is that a lunch I, bucket? Yes, I would say that is a lunch bucket. There's another one up to the right uh, in the row behind him. Oh yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost one to the right of that above yeah, that. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. So they would have to go into the change house and strip down and put on their work clothes because they didn't want people to, um, here's another lunch bucket. Uh, they didn't want people to um, high grade, which was, you know, they would steal the gold. Um, but they, they, the guys all had ways of figuring out how to high grade. So one guy had a, a fake tooth that he would stick gold in. Another guy had a watch that had all the workings taken out of it. And so the time never changed and they never checked his watch and he would, put little gold nuggets in his watch and haul it out, you know, so they had ways of, of, of doing it. So anyway. They fed it to the mules too, didn't they? Some of it the, from Virginia city and then it would oh. come out and poop. I, I hadn't heard that, but, but the mules actually in the Kennedy never left the mine. They stayed, they were born, lived their whole lives and, and died down in the mines and, and they were, pretty much blind because they were in the darkness all the time so they couldn't really come out and um i did i sh i think i showed uh, i have a picture of them loading on the skip so um you'll be able to see uh, you couldn't take a donkey up and down in that skip i'm not sure how you would do it okay here's a funny picture so uh back in the days of the gold rush, um, 
the oldest profession in the world was uh, very prominent in the city of Jackson. And so, um, and, uh, and up until, you know, my, when my dad was a teenager, um, it was actually up until the 50s that um, they, uh, before they shut down the, the houses of ill repute, and so, um, and uh, Edward G. Robin, Edward G. Brown Sr. is the one who actually made them close down the houses of prostitution. And so, um, because it was, it was, you know, gambling and prostitution were very prevalent in Jackson up to that point. Um, and so these guys, they were called the fifth, Filthy Five. So that's, um, let me see if I can read them off. Okay, so that's Guy Reynolds. Uh, uh, Peter Casanelli, I'm not sure which one he is. This is Duff Chapman. Um, let's see. Uh, anyway, so they were called the Filthy Five and they put this together, this heart-shaped plaque um, as, um, as uh, you know, like a, to commemorate the houses of ill repute. Ill repute. And on the bottom, it had, uh, uh, and um, what do you call it when it's all the initials um, um, that stand for something? Anyway, so it, it standed, uh, so it said uh, on the bottom, it was, uh, it said erections, and it was like the effication of the something or, anyway, it was this whole long, you know, antigram that, that spelled out erections and so of course then it made national news because they had put this chart shaped plaque you know in 1968 and people were shocked that it it said that on the plaque and so anyway it, it made national news and they ended up having to dig it out of the out of the concrete because they didn't want it in the in the sidewalk and so they had to do a new plaque with it without the erections on the bottom so anyway um but so the so this was, these were very, one of them was a dentist. Um, Dr. Rebello is one of these guys. I think that's Dr. Rebello. He was the district attorney, Guy Reynolds. Uh, Duff Chapman was a historian. Um, um, who was that? Is that, uh, I can't remember. Anyway. Long story short, it, it was just a, it's a colorful story about Amador County. Um, and the plaque is actually in the museum now. Um, they used to have plaster casts of it that, that they sold. And I'm thinking that the Historical Society should do that for a fundraiser and sell some more of those plaques. So anyway, next slide. Okay, so here is the Catholic Church in, in Jackson. This is St. Patrick's. Um, and this is the confirmation class. And it's amazing to me how many kids were in this group. And this is from, oh, it doesn't give a year, but um, a lot of kids from the, and then here's the, uh, it looks like some parents. I don't see the nuns, but anyway, that was a confirmation class from Jackson. And, and knowing the size of the town, that's a lot of kids. Okay, so here's a picture. This is the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, it is the oldest church in North America. It's, it's the mother church for uh, Serbian religion. And, um, it's um, it was built in. Let me see. Uh, Serbian Orthodox. Yeah, in my, um, my biological mother's. That's my biological mother's church. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, anyway, so we get a lot of of contacts from from Serbia. In fact, I have a guy who is um, um, a Serbian who um, I talk to on a regular basis. Um. I believe this was during the funerals during the Argonaut mine disaster because I see the flags are at half staff and it looks to me like um, uh, it's a service of some sort. Back in 1922, there was a Argonaut mine disaster and um, my great grandfather, the one who worked at the Keystone actually was killed in it. 
uh, there were 47 miners that were killed in that disaster. We, and it was one of the largest mine disasters in, um, in uh, history. And um, up until you know, recent times, and actually it made them change a lot of the mining safety rules um, from that disaster. And what, what happened was a, um, a fire started at the, so I'm gonna say the 500-ish foot level and there were guys down at the um, 3,000 foot level working and the smoke basically asphyxiated them. And so if they'd have been able to turn the draft the other way, if they could have turned, you know, reversed the fans, they could have blown the smoke out and the guys probably would have been fine. Um, but unfortunately, the fans only went one way and so uh, they perished. And, and it took them two weeks to get to them and um, they probably died within the first five hours of the, of the disaster. So anyway, but it, it was huge. And that was another time that the, that the um, stamp mill shut down. And, um, you know, and as you can see, the whole city turned out. It was a, you know, very big disaster, very sad. Okay, this is just one of the old hotel boarding houses. Um, and it's actually a boarding house right now. I mean, it, it's apartments that people live in. This one had a, it, back in the day, it had a bar. Um, but uh, anyway, um, this one is on Broadway. Um, across the street was a, a, the, the Paravich boarding house. That one, the Paravich is gone. Um, Anyway, a lot of times the miners would stay uh, with their own ethnic group just, just because they, you know, they created little communities. Um, so, you know, all of the Serbians would stay in a, you know, in a Serbian boarding house and the Italians would stay in an Italian boarding house. And I think it was probably because they had a lot of language, you know, barriers and, and that sort of thing. Um, Okay, this is a picture of the Argonaut. And um, it's not quite as impressive now as it was back then. Um, right now you, you can see the head frame and uh, there's a road that comes in from this side called Spun Road. So you can come right up and there's like a fence and you can look right at it. And um, um, I think the Argonaut's very pretty. Um, the Kennedy is nice, but I, I kind of have a impartial to the Argonaut and maybe it's just because my grandfather, you know, passed away there and, and um, anyway. All of the mines pretty much shut down during World War II and then because they filled up with water and, and stuff, it was really hard for them to reopen and I think the only one that reopened was the Central Eureka. And uh, uh, my grandfather actually worked at the Century Eureka. He was with in the last crew um, when they shut it down. So, okay, here's a picture of the old courthouse. So this building right here is, is the original courthouse. Then they did an annex to it, which was this piece over here. And then, then they later added this middle section and connected the two buildings together. And uh, then this was the library, which um, uh, I'm going to say in the 60s, um, they moved the library downtown or down um, near the creek in Jackson. And then this became the district court. So Superior Court was upstairs here in the main building. And then the district court was down here. Uh, but this was all of the offices for the county. So it was the district attorney's office, the auditor's office, the assessor's office, tax collector, everybody was in this building. Uh, and then in, oh gosh, I'm gonna say in the eighties, they moved to another building, um, which was the Blue Shield building, which was up by Argonaut High School. And they were there for a few years until they built the new administration building, which is downtown Jackson. And um, the old uh, Blue Shield building became the circuit court. So anyway, but this building, um, I'm gonna say in the, the 30s, 
the late 30s, early 40s, they they uh, they turned it into an Art Deco building. And I and it makes me so sad every time I see it because I love this old fashioned brick building and I'm not a big fan of Deco. So um, anyway, but like they they came out with the facade and these stairs are actually inside instead of outside and they changed it a lot. So anyway. Uh, that's the uh, Hall of Records. So, and then see, it's that's before they added the uh, the connection between the two buildings. Uh, and the people here on the stairs, I'm going to say one of them is Anthony Caminetti. I think this one. Um, but so look at the the clerk with his little visor hat. I think this is uh, Sheriff Rust here. Um, I think Caminetti was either district attorney at that time or just an attorney. Okay, here's a picture of the old high school. So this was the original Jackson Union High School. And um, um, it's, now, it's now the district office um, building. Uh, and then the high school um, actually is over the hill um, by where the courthouse is, but they've had, this is actually the junior high is up, is up here now. Um, and my house is right over here. Uh, anyway, um, I always thought that this, this building looked like, uh, the Alamo or something. Um, anyway, um, the sort of the history on the Jackson high school was, um, they had an election because they wanted to build a high school because all of the houses were, or all of the schools were, you know, basically, you know, housed in one spot. So kindergarten through 12th grade was all in one building. And so they wanted to create a high school. So they had an election and um, the community voted to either have the main high school in Sutter Creek or in Jackson. And so this was like, I'm gonna say 1910, 1911. And so they had an election and Sutter Creek won by, you know, maybe 10 votes or something. And so they were going to build the high school in Sutter Creek. And so uh, Jackson said, no, we're not going to go to Sutter Creek. So they said, fine, we'll build our own high school. So they, you know, so they did fundraising and they ended up building this high school uh, about the same year. So I think they opened in 19. 12 or 13, you know, so they, they, you know, so they decided we'll just have our own high school. So that's how Jackson High School came about. Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was a funny story. And the thing that's really funny is, you know, even now there's, you know, when the two high schools play against each other, that's the big rivalry and they always want to beat the other, you know, the other school and stuff. And it's, it's just funny how you know, here's, oh, this says 1913. So um, anyway, I just think it's funny that, um, you know, that, that rivalry never died. It's still, you know, a hundred some odd years later and, and they still have that same town to town rivalry. Uh, okay, so here's the grammar school. So this was where the high school actually was before um, they built the, you know, be, they built the new high school. So, um, and then this building is actually gone, which makes me very sad because I, I just love this bell tower. I think it's just really neat. Um, they actually still have the bell on campus, but it's, you know, it's a modern, you know, single story, you know, uh, school now that they put in, I'm going to say probably in the, the 50s. Okay, so here is, this is the Kennedy mine property prior to putting in the big head frame. It's when they were trying to figure out exactly where they wanted to drop the, the, um, the shaft and put the head frame and so on and so forth. Um, I believe there was two shafts running at this point. Uh, let's see. It's top. Okay, it's one of the top producers that developed uh, Two shafts operating near the turn of the century, the corporation began making uh, the east shaft where you see the head frame today. So, anyway. 
Here's another picture of the fire on, of the head frame. That was in 28. Let's see, it says something about an automobile. Anyway, okay, next. Okay, this is the, okay, so this is the original courthouse, which it says it was the second courthouse. This was built in 1864. There was a big fire in 1862, which destroyed the first courthouse, which was a wooden structure. And so then when they rebuilt it, they made this brick structure. So that was the original courthouse. And these are county officials all in the, on Teresa, the Teresa yeah. I, have, I have a question. Yeah. In the, mm -hmm. county, in the county courthouse fire, were the records destroyed? So is there a gap in the records that, that are in your office as a result of that fire? I would say yes. I, everything, I'm going to say everything was destroyed because, um, you know, and I do have missing, like, um, I keep hoping I'm going to find the Holy Grail because some of the older uh, naturalization books are missing. And so I don't know if they had been destroyed in the fire, if anyone was able to rescue them. I haven't read any stories about it, um, you know, but that's something that I keep searching for. I, I keep hoping that, you know, somebody, you know, um, before Larry started the, the archives, you know, a lot of times they would just, oh, let's get rid of this stuff or, oh, we got some water damage. You know, nobody's going to want this stuff anyway, and they and they threw stuff out. So I'm hoping that that didn't happen. I'm hoping that somebody rescued some of the stuff, you know, and that some someday that stuff is going to turn up, um, you know. But I keep hoping. Um, I know in the 1862 fire, really, the entire town of the entire city of Jackson was burned. I, I think one building survived. And, um, and what happened was when the fire started, they called, them, called the fire you know, crew in and they had these like 500 gallon tanks all around the city that they would use, you know, that they would put a pump to it and they would pump the water out and put the fire out. Well, the problem is the two fire crews hooked into the same tank and they ran out of water. So by the time they moved and reprimed and got the water, I mean, the fire was just totally out of control and, and they basically lost the whole city. And, uh, you know, it's pretty tragic, but. Okay, so here, let's see, this is in 1895. This is a picture of looking out over the city. So you can see, here's the courthouse. It's before they made the addition to the, um, you know, so there's the courthouse and the hall of records. Um, here's the Catholic church. This is St. Patrick's where we saw the, um, those, all of the uh, uh, confirmation kids. Uh, this one is the Methodist church. They've since put a steeple on it. Here is the grammar school before they made the addition. So, um, um, Anyway, then this right here, this is the Brown House. That is actually where the museum is now. So the museum and mine model. Um, if you ever have a chance to come and see the mine model in operation, it's really interesting. Um, a guy named uh, Post uh, made a, a replica, replica of the Kennedy mine and you, they turn it on and the wheels turn and the stamp mill goes up and down and the skip goes up and down. And, and it's, it's really interesting. And, and uh, it basically tells the story of the Kennedy mine. And it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, you know, so that would be a great field trip. So you can come here and check out the archives and you can go check out the Kennedy, the, you know, the, uh, do the Kennedy Mine Tour, which is a really, really neat tour, and then also see the museum, and uh, and then go wine tasting. Lots to do in Jackson. Okay, this is another shot from uh, looking across. So here's St. Patrick's. Then uh, here's Butte Mountain. So Butte Mountain is, um, you know, very, you know prominent landmark 
in Amador County because you know you see it when you're coming down into Jackson, you can't miss it. And now there's a tower on this. So this is prior to the tower coming in, but there's a, a Channel 13 built a, a tower there uh, for their um, for t the TV station. And now the uh, sheriffs use it and the waters use it to control their the dams and all that kind of stuff. Uh, here's the Methodist Church. The steeple is on it. Uh, here's the grammar school. All of these trees is where uh, Brown House is, where the, um, the museum is. It's in here. Um, let's see. This is part of Main Street down here. So there's the courthouse up here. So this is 1905. Uh, this is a 1915, another view of Jackson, just looking across from the other direction. Uh, I don't think that's, let's see, try to get my bearings here. I believe this is from the south end of Jackson, looking up towards the city. So here's this, the, the downtown, this is probably Main Street, I think. Anyway. Okay, here is um, the Kennedy Tailing Wheels. The Kennedy Tailing Wheels are kind of a very a famous landmark in Amador County because um, that was actually like a, a, an environmental um, fix. Uh, because the tailings were very toxic, they used cyanide and all kinds of, you know, mercury and stuff in the, in the processing of the gold. Um, <clears throat> so they used the tailing wheels to actually take the, the mine tailings across to and put them in a pond. So there's a, there's a pond on the, on the backside here. Um, I'm going to say this is uh, wheel one and wheel two. Um, and I'm thinking this is wheel four. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can see. So during the during the war, when they were looking for metals, they actually stripped these buildings down and and uncovered the wheels. The wheels were actually inside these buildings. Um, but they would take the tailings and they'd bring them across, and then they would um, the wheel would carry the the tailings, and then bring them across and so they were they would go up you know they you know they would you know anyway because they had uh, you know like an elevation that they had to travel so anyway so this is i'm pretty sure this is wheel one and wheel two okay here's another these are the carpenters from the kennedy and uh, this guy right here, V.S. Garbarini, he was actually really famous um, in the county. He was an engineer. Um, he's the one who designed the, the frame structure for the, um, the new uh, skip when they, you know, the new head frame when they rebuilt it at the Kennedy. He also uh, engineered the arch dams. Um, so he was, he, uh, he was kind of a a crotchety guy and he had like i don't know seven kids um anyway uh but all of these guys are named so let's see i have this is john tar this is vaughn this is jensen um perry uh and then uh john gibbons humphrey jones vs garbarini and ed k um you know, but here's something, you know, if someone's doing their genealogy and they happen to be related to one of these guys, we've got a pretty good picture of, of, these, of these carpenters at, at uh, the Kennedy. Uh, here is, um, is this the Argonaut or the Kennedy? Okay, this is the Kennedy. So they're, they're just getting ready to go on the skip and you can see the skip is here in the background, but basically, or no, that's the skip right there. Um, basically, it they got on a ladder, so you 
you know, so they would take like, um, I'm going to say like eight guys down at a time. So they would stand on a ladder next to each other. And then the next guy would get up two rungs up and the next guy two rungs up, you know, and then they would like the ground would fall out. They would just drop down super fast. So, and you can tell this is a little bit more modern because of their lamps. And it looks to me like they don't have candles anymore. So, and their lunch buckets are a little more modern too. Although this guy's got a, a bucket, an older one. Um, yeah, this says from the 30s, 1930s. Great advertisement for Levi's. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then here, this is another um, uh, just a south view um, of the Kennedy and just some of the workers. This one's not quite as clear of a shot. You can't really see the faces. Um, okay, then that's the, so let me exit this. And then I just had one more that showed the, um, the guys loading on. So see, see them on the skip. So these guys are actually coming back up, but uh, can you see the ladder? Yeah, I think this is the, anyway, some of them have already gotten off, but they packed them into that really tight. And, and the way that this one is, it's pretty well enclosed. Now, some of them, they didn't have that much safety. And, you know, if you got your shirt caught as you were going up, you got sucked out of the skip and, and, you know, and that was, a, a, I have several coroner's reports talking about, you know, guys getting in accidents, just coming up a skip. So anyway, so that's all the, that's all the photos I had. Um, did anybody have any questions? Uh, let me check the chat box here. Hold on. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one person wanted you to go over how to get to the website again. I did post your website in the chat room. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, I, I actually had some questions while, while I'm waiting for the class to come up with some questions. Um, you, you showed the picture of the high school. Do you have uh -huh. the original high school records? I have yearbooks from, um, I think, 1912 through um, uh, I'm going to say probably the 40s and 50s. Um, I've been working on getting people to donate more modern. Um, I usually, I'll get them when, you know, someone passes away and their family's cleaning out their stuff and they go, oh, well, we don't need that. So then they'll, you know, they'll send in a yearbook or some, you know, some pictures. Um, anyway, um, but that's, that's typically how I get it is if, if a family, um, decides to donate something so and then one of your pictures showed the masonic hall um i know uh, one of the real common records that my students you know go for are the masonic hall records do yes you have, do you have yes the we hall have records? quite a few oh. we have quite a few excellent excellent mm -hmm. um let's see here if anybody has a question go ahead and if you don't mind keep your camera off but go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask the question Hi, this is Wendy. Um, I, I'm sorry I was late to your presentation. I love looking at those. Uh, I had a little bit of work, but I love seeing all the old pictures and mm -hmm. helping you know do the analysis. Um, I my question is is you're you're so passionate about this, and I I love I love hearing you know all your stories. How do I find out information about uh, an event that happened in another state, another town, um, and especially like a town that's kind of there's not much there I mean there's a small town um, my grandpa was part of the thing called the big dig in Moreland Kansas mm -hmm. where they thought they thought they found King Tut King Tut number two uh -huh. treasure. Uh -huh. and so they dug for it and then at the end of the day they thought it was a um, a scam and the police officer was still after the people that perpetrated this scam um, but I do have a few pictures of my grandpa standing over this shaft uh -huh. and i'd like to find more pictures i'd like to find out more about the big dig and um, about king tut and you know about all of this and how do i, get I would say my i would say my first place i would look would be the newspapers 
Okay. You know, look in the newspapers and see if they have if anybody did any articles on it. You know, that would be the I that would be a good place to start. Yeah. It's it is neat when you do find pictures of your um, you know, your family. I it's not a straight on picture of my grandpa, but I know the way my grandpa stands and his yep. stature, so I could tell it was exactly my grandpa. Yeah. Um, why they and they had sheriffs there they had people from every state so um you know um i wish i would listen more but it's i i want to get so i would love to have some more pictures from that you know that time frame yeah so 1936 yeah. well so i i mean so i would first look in the newspapers and then also you know the archives in that area and then maybe the state archives um and see if they have anything um uh, you know i know um the California, you know, room in the, the state library here um, has a lot of stuff on Amador County. So, you know, so I would check that state's library and see, you know, and, or, you know, and their state archives and see what you can find. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have another question too. Um, let's see here. Um, you mentioned some of the collections that you have, like homesteads, marriage records, property transfer, court documents, and coroner's reports. Mm -hmm. Do you have like any stop and start dates for each of these collections? Uh, everything that I have for marriage and for uh, death and all of that stuff is pre-1915. Because after 1915, the clerk recorder's office is required to keep those. And because they're vital records, they don't release them. So um property records you know vital statistics that kind of stuff then you would need to go to clerk recorders a lot of times i'll get a call from someone who says well i live on a ranch you know here and i want to find out the history of my house and so that's really not something i can look up for them i might have a homestead or something but the problem is i don't have their modern address so I need them to go do a title search and get names of property owners prior to, you know, prior to their ownership. So then I can then look up those names because I don't necessarily have property information. I do have, you know, property exchanges, but it's, it's more identified by the people who did the exchange as opposed to, you know, that actual property. Yeah, you know, that's a big thing now in genealogy is, mm -hmm. is finding out the history of your home. That, that's a, we actually have several yes. books in our genealogy collection specifically on that topic. Right, right. So, yeah, so, no. most, of your, so most of your records then are pre-1915? Pre-1915, yeah. I have, I mean, I obviously have other things that are more modern and, and we try to collect things, you know, like I try to, you know, if there's events, posters and that kind of stuff, I, I try to, you know, I'll grab them and, and I'll put them in a, you know, to be accessioned pile. And um, the assessor's office here in Amador County just went digital. And so they got rid of all of their, you know, home records. Well, the problem I have is, okay, so they gave me a great big box, but they gave me a great big box of photos. And the APN number is written on the back. So I'm going to have to have my volunteers go through and research, okay, this parcel number is this address, you know, and so I will have some, you know, more information on those properties, but I won't necessarily have ownership records. You know what I mean? So yeah, I have a picture of your house, but I have no other vital information because they took that information off of the photo they just took the photos and threw them in a box so anyway so yes it's neat to have the photos but yeah i would really like to have the information too but now you you mentioned you shared those wonderful immigration records um yes normally i kind of associate immigration records with like you know uh a federal level how how did you come across uh, and and come to store the immigration records do you know the history of how so you those get that? those are from the superior court so i have a lot of superior court documents and and a lot of superior court books and so if they naturalized in amateur county then you know those vital records were with our superior court they probably also have a federal record but they don't necessarily have a federal record and i know you know, the older ones especially don't. 
the only copy would have been here. And so we have the information that, you know, that yes, that person was naturalized here, but we don't have the actual documents, you know, from their book. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Because immigration records are sometimes very expensive to obtain. Right. So, uh, it's, right. It's, it's a wonderful additional resource to know where else to look. Right, right. And I've also done where, the, you know, they want to get, you know, they want me to certify the record. And so um, I actually have a certification that I print out on, you know, on a certificate that, you know, says that, yes, this person was, you know, this is their vital information you know, so that I can confirm. And then I, you know, put the county stamp on it and the whole thing. So, um, so it becomes a vital record. Wow, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, now, let's see here. Um, you, you've mentioned Italians, Serbians. Uh, what other ethnic groups, especially during the, you know, the 1800s when the mines were really active, what other ethnic groups were there? Do you know? Uh, yes, Chinese, very, very prominent. Um, there's, uh, around Emmer County, there's lots of little rock walls that were built. Those were built by the Chinese. Um, we have, um, um, we have, a the Chinese, um, there was a pretty good group in, um, the Fiddletown that was the latest, the latest, you know, settlement and, um, the two key store is, is very famous. And we have a lot of vital records from the 1800s and, um, the Chinese, their tradition was if someone died, they would, the family would raise money to have the body exhumed and sent back to China. And so we have the records of the people making the donations to move the bodies and then the actual moving of the bodies. And in the 1906 earthquake, they had the same records in, in San Francisco well, those records have all been lost because of the fire and the and stuff in 1906 from the earthquake. So um, a lot of the, the Chinese artifacts we have are one one of a kind, you know, information. Um, uh, we've had several uh, professors from China come and do translations and stuff on the Chinese records. Um, so we have Italians, Serbians, uh, Chileans, you know, people from uh, South America, uh, main uh, Chile is is one of the countries where they talk about you know immigrants coming. Um, also, uh, lots of Mexicans because in California it was part of Mexico for a long time, <clears throat> and so there were a lot of big ranchos and there's even still property disputes that date back way back when um, when uh, California transitioned to um, the United States. And um, so uh, there were a lot of property controversies. So anyway, so there's a lot of uh, Mexican Americans, there's uh, Native Americans, the Miwoks were very prevalent in this area. Um, we have one of the largest grinding stones, um, an example of grinding stones um, in Volcano, they have uh, actually a, a park uh, called Indian Grinding Rocks, and you can go and see a huge piece of granite with all of these little, you know, mortar holes in it where they um, they were, uh, you know, grinding the acorns. Um, let's see. Um, the guy who wrote the book was from Switzerland. Now he was on the border of Italy and France, and but he was he's from Switzerland. Um, you know, so uh, uh, Madame Pantaloon was from France. Um, let's see. Um, so there was a, there was a group of, of French. In fact, um, the French, um, they had a big garden and they actually supplied a lot of the food to the town. Um, I have some diaries of people talking about when they first came here and how tough it was and how they were starving and they were trying to make, you know, um, make ends meet. And this one gal, she did, she did sewing for some of the miners to make some money. And um, she was all excited one day because she found a gooseberry bush. And so she made gooseberry pies and she sold them. And, um, you know, it was just interesting how hard it was to be this far away from civilization and, you know, how hard they had to work and, and, uh, and stuff. So, it, you know, 
Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. You know, it would be so fascinating if these diaries were ever cross-referenced with all the names that are, you know, because like yes. the diary yes. may not be your ancestor. Your ancestor may be named as a neighbor in that diary. Exactly, exactly. You know, so, um, yeah, no, and, and how people worked together. So, you know, so this one gal, you know, so she left with her brother. She came across. She left her children in, like, Missouri with her aunt and came here, and I'm thinking, I, I don't think I would have left my children to come here, you know, but people were more adventurous, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't think I would have wanted to bring my children because I don't think they would have survived. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's very, they were a hearty bunch of people. Yeah, I think we all realize our ancestors were, were very hearty people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, you showed us those wonderful pictures of the, you know, of the, of the towns. Um, uh -huh. Do you have Sanborn maps that would, would be able to be, you know, cross? I do. I do. I have, with the, in yes. other words, so if you could find your ancestor's address on the Sanborn map, yes. using the photographs, you could probably actually find their house in the photographs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, I do have the Sanborn maps. In fact, um, uh, real, uh, an ancestor of the Gallo family uh, was was born in Jackson, um, and then they had family also that lived in Amador City, and some of the family came over from Italy. It was a, a grandfather and his grandson came, and they were related to the Gallos, and I was able to show them the sandbar map to show where their family had lived, and then we had... Um, I had old pictures of Amador City and you could just catch parts of the building, you know, cause they had like a, a store and, um, you know, and then they were able to actually go to the town and see the place where, you know, it's a wine tasting room now where, um, where their family's um, property was. But, um, you know, and then we have like, not a whole lot of artifacts, but we have a few, we have like, um, they used to use tokens in the bars. And so we have some old bar tokens um, from, you know, that, so they say, you know, they'll say the name of the, of the bar and, uh, anyway, they're just, they're interesting. Well, you do have a great job. <laughs> I do. I mean, you know, and, and, uh, oh, and I have, so, uh, Croatian is another, um, uh, group, ethnic group. And, um, I have a friend, Tom Nikovic, who has been researching the Croatians that came over from Croatia. He actually moved back to Croatia. He's living there now, but um, he's done extensive research on the Croatians that, you know, came to America. And um, so whenever I have a Croatian question, I, I email him or I call him and say, Hey, what about this one? Or, you know, or I'll, I'll, you know, connect the people who are making the question with him, you know, and he has a lot of, a lot of information. Be a um, good resource for Randall. Yeah, yeah it was, you know what, Todd? I just I, funny you would say that because I was just looking on the list of people who are in class today, and I don't see his name. <laughs> no, I didn't. I haven't heard him. So yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. That's very funny. Now, is um, he of Croatian descent? Yes, he is. And oh, it, I'll awesome. tell you, it's a real hard. It, we've been having a real hard time tracing his family because oh. you know, here in America, it's pretty simple. But you know, once you get over the, the pond, yeah. it becomes much more difficult. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. But well, I, would so definitely let, I would definitely put him in touch with you. Definitely, definitely. And Tom actually is working on putting his life work online. So he's actually got, you know, um, I forget what the name of the program that he's using, but it's excellent. And his book is online as well. And so you can actually go in and turn the pages and, re you know, you can search for the name that you're looking for and it'll put you to the right page. And, and so, and he has got tons of photos. So yeah, no, Tom would definitely be a resource for well, him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I, I think the class is probably, I know right now because of COVID-19 that you're, you're, you're still locked down, but you know, when, when, when things start to open up again, what are your, your days and times of the week that, that the office is available? Okay, so right now during COVID, I am taking appointments. So if you wanted to come in, you can make an appointment and I take appointments in the afternoon because in the morning I'm doing records management and I'm usually really busy. Um, so, um, in the afternoon, you can come in, just, just make an appointment, and I just do one at a time. So if it's a family group, that's fine, but um, just one appointment um, at a time. And so like Monday's already booked. 
but typically when COVID is not in, not in session, whatever, um, Mondays were open to the public. So you can come in anytime on a Monday and I have volunteers here on that day and, and we'll take you know whoever comes. And usually it's really busy. If you wanna come on a different day, you just call and make an appointment. And then uh, I make sure that someone is available to help you, you know, do your research. Because what, you, you, we pretty much just have to pull things. If I have it scanned already, you know, then we can pull it up on the computer and that's easy. But, um, you know, that's something that we're working on right now. So, um, so we don't necessarily have everything scanned. Does, do you have to pay for the copies or, or do you do digital copies for free? How does this work? We charge $5. And the five dollars goes directly back to our budget. I have a five hundred dollar budget for the year, and that's to buy paper and ink and whatever supplies I need. So it really helps me to just you know. So five dollars is a pretty nominal cost, and um, and and if it's a document that I do as a PDF, I consider that one document. So if it's three pages, if it's twenty pages, if I have it all scanned as one document then it's one document and that's $5. So I try to, you know, make it as reasonable as I can, you know, and still keep my doors open. Understood. So. Well, believe me, I completely understand budget issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, class, uh, any, other, any other questions? Go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask Teresa. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, um, Teresa, I wanted to say thank you very much. Your, your, your passion for your, for your profession is certainly obvious, and Thanks. we really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise today. And most of all, we really appreciate you letting us videotape this.